Hello and welcome to the Capital Games Movie Club. I am the Wiz. And I'm Zero. Zero. Today mm. we are watching another romance film, as was the uh, agreement from the last time. And this week we chose the 1999 Roger Mitchell film, Notting Hill, starring Hugh Grant and Julia Roberts. Um... I guess before we get into the review, I'm just going to have a confession to make. This is one of my all-time favorite movies, so you probably already know what my review is going to be <laughs> at this point. But um, when I gave the option to Zero, I was actually pretty happy that he chose this. Because I'm an evangelist for this film, and I, I like I said, I love it. So I, I will be severely disappointed if Zero doesn't like it, but that's fair if he doesn't. But let's find out. Zero, what did you think of Notting Hill? Uh, it was quite lovely. It okay. was quite a lovely little film. Um, I always forget how much I love Julia Roberts. Mm -hmm. Because just uh, she's she's just got this very magnetic smile when yes. she, uh, when there's a sequence where she has to smile and everything. Just it's so magnetic. Yes. And it's funny that you mentioned that because um, one of the criticisms about her in the 90s after Pretty Woman, when she hit it, was huge and hit it really big, she did a lot of movies where it was serious and sober and, you know, try, it was really just uh, trying to convince people she was a serious actor, and it kind of didn't work out. There are some movies that people like, like Sleeping with the Enemy, I think is one where people say, that's actually a good movie, but it didn't turn into good box office. The critics kind of roasted her, and she didn't go back to doing romantic comedies until 1997 with My Best Friend's Wedding. And people would point out, it's that smile. It's that, like you said, this magnetic, beautiful smile that when she does it, it captures the whole frame. And this movie plays to those strengths, I would say. But go ahead, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh and Hugh Grant, um, he's uh, he's a lovely, uh, lovely actor in this as well too. Um, romance is definitely not my genre, so I mean, I don't know if like I couldn't say that it's like his best performance or anything like that. But yeah, just I found him to be very personable, which is good for a romance movie. Uh, this is um, my opinion that it's probably his best film. Uh, some might say it's Four Weddings and a Funeral. A few might say it's about a boy, but I honestly think this is him and his most charismatic. Uh, Hugh Grant, uh, both actors, actually, I would say, rely on their natural charisma to get a good performance in. And I think for both actors, this is where they were the strongest. And to have, I say, at the time of the 90s, probably two of the most charismatic actors in one film that actually was written pretty well and it was pretty smart, I, I think, to me, really cemented how this movie is so great and such a wonderful film to watch because you have these two lead actors that, and, and honestly, if you had somebody else playing these roles, it wouldn't work. It, it just, it, it wouldn't be the same movie at all. So... The, the casting was well done. I think they wrote the film specifically for these two actors, too. Because it really felt like they took their strengths uh, from these actors and just married the characters into it. So I, I like I said, this is just a, an incredibly charismatic film, I, I think. And it's because of those elite actors. And, and I want to point out also uh, the actor Reese Ephens. Uh, he plays Spike, the, the, the roommate in the film. Um, <laughs> yeah. He is particularly funny in this movie. And um, it was um, it was really the his character pretty much, I, I would say, prepared you for, I think, a film that you were, like, if, if you saw the, the trailer, and we'll get to the trailer and everything, because I have things to say about it. If you saw the trailer of the film, you are thinking one entirely thing, one entire thing, but then when you meet the character Spike, the film opens up a little and says, it's a little more than that. So, 
and it prepares you to be a little bit surprised with the directions that the movie goes into. Yeah, uh, yeah when Spike appears, man, holy cow, it just kind of, there is a curb onto things, and it's just like, oh, I see, there's going to be some... Uh, some comedy bits in here. This will be real interesting. <laughs> and the thing is, sometimes with these admittedly dumb, like dim, overly horny, over like really disgusting kind of people as the 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 roommates or the best friends as a comedy thing, it really is used to get a cheap laugh. Really, but it. Although there are cheap laughs in the movie in regards to Spike, he's still a likable character, even though he's fairly disgusting. <laughs> if you really, if you, if you really pare down to what the character is, so yeah, I mean, I would say that Reese Ethan's actually, to me, and I said this when it came out, and I said it when Oscars. I think he was robbed of the best supporting actor nod. Like I think he. He had a really good performance in this movie, and it should have gotten a lot more praise than it did. And it's mainly because comedies at the time, and still to this day, comedies at the time don't get the respect that they deserve in, let's say, the Academy Awards or the Golden Globes. So those types of performances don't get honored as much as, say, a dramatic performance. So, And that sucks, because it's actually a very good performance. What I liked a lot about the movie... Um, it's going to remind me of the movie. I know you haven't seen this, but uh, and people are going to hear this and going to be like, "Hi, huh? what are you talking about? This movie reminds me of Her. And Her is a movie that takes one idea and extrapolates it smartly to an eventual end where you're not thinking, I, I wonder if they did this, what would happen? No, they would take the idea that you're thinking of and then go with it completely. Like, they, they don't... This could have easily been a cheap um, uh, movie star meets poor guy. They magically fall in love, and it's a Cinderella story. But they don't do that. They're smart with what they do in the movie. So they, they show that, first off, there is depth to the characters. Both have been in bad relationships. Both have dealt with hurt. Um... Uh, Anna, in particular, Anna Scott, the one that Julia Roberts plays, she's been in particularly nasty situations, especially with her line of work. Um, so they definitely do more with the role than just being a boy meets girl and boy and girl just so happens to be the most popular actress in the world. So I definitely enjoyed that, especially when I was getting into uh, filmmaking and and wanting to do film criticism and possibly writing film, uh, this movie actually made me think of how you know how good a, a script can be by not just going by the standard formula, but by peeling the onion a little more and getting more out of let's say the, the idea of the of the movie because around the time. Romance films were not particularly deep, and I'm going to be honest, it's, this is not a particularly deep film, but the ideas that they come up with to to do the standard uh, will-they-won't-they they, uh, angles of most romance films is a little more creative than what most romance films would be. Uh, the example I would use is that the aggressor in the film is entirely Anna Scott. Like, she's the one pursuing Hugh Grant throughout the entire film, which is uh, which is a subversion of most romantic films because it's usually the man who is the one in power and the one that has to chase the girl. So that was a, a different way of doing the, the, uh, the doing the movie. Yeah, and I think that was what I thought was um, kind of interesting, just instead of just focusing on uh, the man pursuing the woman, it's just completely just flipped on its head right and it, it would make no sense whatsoever to have hugh grant's character be the one pursuing her because he would just end up being a stalker at that point so the fact that and they could have really really just leaned on the 
the oh, would it be a dream to to fall in love with the most beautiful woman in the world? Which, in essence, a lot of romance films are like that. But because she is a film star, it pretty much you're you're pretty much given the the expectation that that is who she is in this world. Like there, there is no doubt about it. She has to be one of the most beautiful women in the world. If she is a famous Hollywood actor. So that, that whole, that whole plot line that most romance films of is, is basically making you believe the character is falling madly in love with the woman. Uh, and think she's the most beautiful woman in the world. It, It kind of, it's another subversion where it's like, oh no, she is the most world beautiful one in the world because she's this, and it's kind of can't be disputed. So there, <laughs> you don't have to worry about that part. That's that's there. It's done. It's over with. Move on to a different idea. I mean, we said it, I already said it. Um, these the script seemed to the script seemed to be specifically tailored for these two actors, but. Uh, I I have to as much as I love Hugh Grant. I I think Hugh Grant is impossibly charming, and I think he's a really. I think as a, just in in terms of charisma, he's a very good actor, and he can make. Uh, basically, he can make a meh film into a watchable film, just for being in it and being himself, which not a, not a lot of actors can do. I. I actually really still like Julia Roberts' performance, and I'm not particularly a Julia Roberts fan, to be completely honest with you. Um, I did like her in Pretty Woman. I liked her in My Best Friend's Wedding, and she was okay in the movie she won an Oscar in. But, uh, but in this movie, uh, and I guess because uh, because this is kind of a meta movie uh, in regarding to her life and. Uh, what she dealt with with the press and being a megastar. She added a lot of depth to the role that if it wasn't Julia Roberts in this role, would have not felt particularly believable. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Especially since just... um, I think really uh, her having just a just captivating smile just kind of cemented in just how hot the celebrity of Anna Scott was, and it was just kind of a match made in heaven, in my opinion. Yeah, because I'm thinking of actresses in the 90s that could have pulled off this role, and I I can't think of anybody. And I'm even if you rewrote the role for some other actress, I don't think this would have worked. I mean, what we have... God, I, I can't... I'm not even going to look up the famous actors in the 90s, but it... There were a few actresses that were just as big. Maybe Halle Berry. Um, maybe uh, I don't know. There, but there were a, a few actresses that could have done this role. But I think the perfect person for this was Julie Roberts, and she pretty much she really nailed the performance in a way that I don't think any actress could. Especially make it believable that she would fall in love with uh, Hugh Grant's character in the movie, who admittedly is uh, all right. It's kind of harsh. He's kind of a loser. He's kind of a, a guy who not nah, losers harsh. Losers too harsh. He's down on his luck. He he owns a travel bookstore that's not making money, and she and he. And he, he's falling. He, he's had a rough go of life until he meets Anna Scott in the movie. Um, but yeah, like Julia Roberts, I think is it's just a fantastic performance in this. Uh, in in a role that honestly, I mean, she she was born to play. But but before I saw the movie, I had serious doubts that she could do very well. But she did, and it's fantastic. Why don't we get into the romance of the film? Um, I'm surprised by how believable it is, even to this day. Uh, uh, let me let me just be clear. I've seen this film now nine times. Nine times. And each time that I've seen this film, it was I saw it once in the theaters, and I'll get into how I got convinced to see this movie. 
And then the other seven times, it was to convince other people to watch this movie. By saying, no, 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 this is actually a legit great movie. You have to watch it. And it's always like either uh, girls I was dating, my best friend who was a film buff, um, just people in general who would be like, like we would look at me and go, you like Notting Hill. I'm like, I love Notting Hill. You have to watch it. I will watch it with you, <laughs> and you will you will be wrong. You will be surprised by how good this movie is. And each time, everyone's like, "That's a good movie! Holy shit!" <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> and um, I think I've convinced you now, haven't I? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like um, I had mentioned on last week's podcast that um, I did see. Um, Love Actually, uh, mm-hmm. which uh, I quite liked. Yeah. So um, I I had a pretty good feeling that Notting Hill would probably be a lot of fun, and okay. turned out that was in fact correct. Would you? What did you like more? Did you like Notting Notting Hill more or Love Actually more? Um, it would be like telling a parent to pick between their favorite child. Um, I loved both of them for completely different reasons. Choose now. Um, <laughs> Um, no, go ahead. I will say, um, I will say that I love Notting Hill mostly because it's just a singular focus story and just mm-hmm. the push and pull throughout the entire film is just, it's just fun and, um, definitely kind of on the believable end of things because just, uh, just, uh, um, when we get into spoilers, uh, I can elaborate more, but, yes. um, I love. Uh, I also love um, Love Actually because of the fact that it felt kind of like a slice of life story, where you've got like a um, a collection of small short stories about different romances and the different dynamics in the romances. Right. So it kind of felt like a nice um, sampler of love stories. Right. Um, no, we're not having a review of Love Actually, but I might as well get into it. I didn't like Love Actually at all. Uh, I was very disappointed <laughs> by it, uh, and. This is also because this was the first film that the writer of Notting Hill directed. So I was through the moon excited. And I was like, oh my god, this cast, this this the, the this ensemble story, oh my god, that sounds brilliant. And I watched it and I was like, uh half of this doesn't work. <laughs> I was like, oh no. <laughs> And I ended up uh, at the time just saying I don't like this movie. I mean, there's some good things in the movie. I think, again, Hugh Grant and his love story is good. Emma Thompson and Alan Rickman's is pretty good. Um, I think those were the only two I liked. And the rest, I was kind of like, meh, it's okay. I think the I think the one that gets memed all the time is the guy with the 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 place cards saying how much he loves his his best friend's is now his best friend's wife i think was probably the corniest thing i've ever seen and also was just like that's not really charming that's f- kind of fucked up actually so it's like uh, that's eh. <laughs> okay that's that sucks but anyway um I did like his next film, though, which is About Time. Uh, we should see About Time at some The comedy actually marries itself very well to the romance. I mean, it's mainly because the comedy is used to really charm the viewer. It, it's, yes, okay, Spike has his outrageous moments. Uh, the t-shirts, the, um, him and his underwear for most of the film. Uh, yeah, I get that. But when it's between the two characters, it's just to show how utterly charming this romance is. Uh the dialogue is pretty is really good in this. The um the way the actors deliver it, like very not overly cutesy, but cute enough where you have that like I'll, I'll I'll I I just watched it about an hour ago. The, you have these I had these little pings in my heart going. Oh my god, would I love to have a romance like that where we're saying all these cute things together and it, it's kind. God, I'm fuck. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm a sap. That's 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 just the truth. But the. 
the dialogue itself, I think, stands out very well between Anna Scott and William, who is the character that uh, Hugh Grant plays. And even when they get meta with Anna Scott's profession, and they talk about, let's say, the things she has to go through as an actress, which is also things that um, uh, Julie Roberts had to go through as an actress as well, uh, being of renown. Even if you don't get you don't get the meta ness of the of what's going on, it, you still feel for the character, which is really hard to do when the person is one of the richest people in the world, who is also the most popular person in the world. For you to feel bad about a person who, by all intents and purposes, lives a pretty charmed life goes to show exactly how well written this movie is both dialogue wise and the idea of and the idea of the movie as well yeah so um overall just um i'm with you on the comedy bits that it just kind of neatly ties and marries everything in mm-hmm. and it makes you i guess um to a sense sort of appreciate the romantic moments mm-hmm. um because yeah i mean they they're, they're there are some moments where just just things get pretty tense and pretty heavy, and then you just have this this completely wild scenario happen um, that just kind of throws that out the door for a little bit and everything. Yeah. And then and then you have sort of the drama of just that's the push and pull and everything, and it 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 kind of has a nice cadence to it. I yes. guess is what I'm trying to say. It, it gets a little heavy, and then something happens to lessen the blow essentially is what happens and then it slowly ratchets up and then the blow happens and it it, yeah it's you're right on the cadence of it 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 has a nice flow to the movie where things they don't get too heavy so it's still an enjoyable movie uh while not so great things are happening um you want you want to talk about anything else? You want to get into spoilers? It's probably a good time to get into spoilers. Yeah, we better. <laughs> we better. Okay, so at this point, we're gonna get into spoilers for Notting Hill. If you haven't watched the movie, and if you haven't, what's wrong with you? Watch the movie. It's fantastic. I approve. Uh, you can leave now, watch the movie, and come back and listen to spoilers. We're gonna get into spoilers in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so do you want to talk about the movie, or should I talk about what first got me to see the film? Um, you can probably uh, start first and everything. Okay, so, all right, all right, all right, all right. So, I want to start off by saying, do not watch the trailer for Notting Hill. Just don't. You're going to watch the trailer, and you'll be like, this looks like absolute shit, and you'll be right. The... The trailer is probably one of the worst trailers I have ever seen for a movie. I saw the trailer in 99 when... I forgot what movie it was. But I saw the trailer in the movie theater. And I was with a date. And I remember this because the date said, that looks cute. And I, I went, that looks like shit. <laughs> I was like, that looks terrible. <laughs> The, the film, the trailer does not capture what the movie is doing. It was, it, it just took it as a standard love story uh, where the woman just so happens to be the, the most popular actress in the world. And that was it. And even then, they took away a lot of the comedy and the charm and made it, it's about fate. And it's about discovery. And I'm like, this looks like shit. <laughs> I was like, God <laughs> damn. So when... And I was not interested at all to see this movie. At all. So what convinced me to go see it is I was seeing this girl at the time in high school. And you, you, you know Zero where this is going, right? Yeah. Okay, so basically I said, okay... There was a movie I wanted to see at the time, and I forget, I forget what it was now, but there was a movie I wanted to see, but if I watch this movie, I can concentrate less on the movie and more on getting some action. You know, kissing, 
hugging. Right. Maybe grab, <laughs> maybe grab some titty. You know. Yeah. Um. So that was my plan. It was like, all right, I'll watch this shitty movie. I probably won't enjoy it. And I'll just try and, you know, a little kiss in action. Maybe a little titty action. You'll see. <laughs> okay. So, movie starts. And it's like, it's okay. I was like, okay, this is all right. And then Spike's character comes in with the t-shirt gag. And I'm like, oh, okay, this is pretty funny. And I didn't touch that woman for the rest of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I was hooked. I was, I oh love <laughs> this movie so damn much after I saw it. I was like, oh my God, this movie is amazing. And I remember this specifically. My friend was like, so how was the date? The date? Well, you, oh, dude, you have to see this movie. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. How was the date? I'm like, who cares? This movie is great. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. And, and he was like, wait a minute. So let me get this straight. You didn't do anything with this girl because you're watching the movies. Like, you have to understand this is such a sweet, really good movie. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I went into the film basically expecting to hate this movie and ended up a adoring it because and this is no thanks to the trailer the trailer is god awful is terrible um which led me to led me into thinking for about 10 years i had to see as many movies as possible because i didn't know what would be a good or a bad movie so i gave everything a chance I do not recommend that, by the way. That's that's not a good thing, because <laughs> odds are most movies are shit, and you're going to watch a lot of shit by doing that. But yeah, that's what led me to watch this movie at first. Um, anyway, let's get into spoilers. Uh, you know what? You start, and we'll, I'll dive off from you there. Okay. So um, one of my favorite parts is when I'm um, just... Both um, William and Anna finally get intimate and everything, and it's the morning after, and Anna um, says the quote, they go to bed with Hil uh, with Gilda, they wake up with me, and of course, right. with William's just, yeah, uh, William's just like, who's Gilda? And then uh, he goes, um, that was her, Rita Hayworth's most famous part, many men go to bed with the dream, they didn't like it when they would wake up with the reality. Yeah. This one sort of touched a nerve with me, mostly because just um, back when uh, I was still a um, healthcare professional and everything, going on dates was such a terrible time because, of course, um, usual first introduction question of, hey, so what do you do? And, of course, I say the words, yeah, um, I'm a pharmacy technician, and um, I'm also going to... I'm also going to university to study pre-farm and hopefully go to uh, pharmacy school. And of course, so, so many of these, um, these women would just, their eyes would light up with like money bags going, oh, this dude's going to be, going to be freaking loaded. He works in the pharmacy. He's going to go off to pharmacy school. Man, oh man, I, I can't wait to get with that. And of course, um, some of them would get really, really heavy with just kind of the, uh, kind of the intimate play before, before hopping into bed with me and everything. And then, of course, just, just the next morning, they realized that you know, just, um, even though I was a healthcare professional, that I was still just a normal guy too. But just seeing that I wasn't really, I guess, I guess for lack of a better way of putting it, that. Money wasn't my motivator for healthcare. Just it was wanting to to do to do some good in the world was uh, my bigger focus uh, right. for while I was wanting to be in the healthcare industry. It just sort of turned them off, and they're just like, "Oh, gross! You're you're one of those do-gooders, gross!" and and it just kind of hurt because it was just like, "Wow!" So literally, all you just saw me for was a free meal, maybe. Uh, maybe try to fool around it, maybe seal the deal and keep me on the hook for a while, but the minute you find out that my 
motivations in healthcare were more altruistic. You're just like, ew, gross. Wow. Yeah. This freaking sucked. So yeah. that uh, that one line between both Anna and William kind of kind of hit a nerve with me, and it was one of those things I was like, wow, just I didn't expect to be hit with something from my past. Holy shit. It's <laughs> been happening a lot with you with these movies lately, hasn't it? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um it was a it was a really interesting scene. Um I mean I didn't have the personal connection really because um I always wanted to be a writer and that kind of turned women off. <laughs> so they uh my job uh ambitions were never really the thing that uh, I guess attracted women to me. But anyway, um but yeah, it, it was a, it was a good scene because it it, it really I, I'd say it really uh, pointed out the I would say the fetishization fet- oh I can't speak fetishization thank you of I, I guess women in power or famous women that have to, I guess they have to deal with you know I guess being uh, having to be compared to their roles. The being compared to the persons themselves, which was an interesting dichotomy I never thought about. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, I think the one scene, aside from the scene that everyone knows about this movie, that always hit a nerve was the scene in the park where they go to the bench and she's writing the she's reading the inscription about a uh, about a man who uh, built a bench uh, in the park for his wife, and it was an inscription that basically said, "Forever to my wife, who will, with her to her from her husband, who will always sit next, who will sit next to her, everything." And they timed the scene perfectly with the music as well, because the music is a very touching slow song. I forget what the name is. I, I just listened to it, and uh, I forget the name. But when she finally asks William to sit with her, I was like, oh, God. <laughs> I <laughs> wish I could have something like that. Oh, man. <laughs> it's, it's, oh, it, God, this movie hits the notes so well. And it's such... And, <laughs> And it really is the writing and the charm of the actors that pull these scenes off. You have a lesser actor, it doesn't work. And it, God, man, I can go on forever with this movie. Holy shit. Um, but yeah, like every time I watch that scene, it hits me every time. You'd think after watching it nine times, the power would lose itself, or I would know, oh, this is when she does the, oh, okay. And, and no, like, I just watch it now. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's that scene. Um, the family, the, the, when the family meets Anna for the first time was pretty funny, especially the end of that scene. <laughs> the end of that scene is hilarious. You remember that scene? Oh yeah, yeah, the, definitely. The one after that she leaves and they all scream like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> and, and, and Hugh Grant does the line perfectly. Goes, oh, "They always do that when I leave." It's <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> like, and it's those little things that are so charming in this movie. It is. Oh, it's so damn cute. Oh, God. Yeah. That and um, his reaction when just Spike just does something so bad or so screwed up, just the dry, right, is yeah. the sort of reaction that he has. It's just, you kind of sympathize with him. You're just like, oh, God, what a clusterfuck this is. Yeah. Hugh Grant plays him as a well-intentioned, well-meaning, uh, affable, a Hugh Grant character, essentially. Less charming than he would be in, let's say, four weddings and a funeral, but still charming enough, I, I would say, in the movie. In this movie, um, they do the will they won't they at angles pretty well. Um, first, when it comes to uh, basically uh, her lying about having a boyfriend, well, did she? Okay, that's debatable. 
I say she lied because she never mentioned it to him. But the story pretty much says everyone knew she had a boyfriend, so he kind of should have known. So, eh, I don't know about that. And then the second time where basically uh, the press finds out where they li- where she's at, and she gets really nasty with him about it, thinking that she sold he sold them out. Yep. And then, honestly... I'm ashamed to say this. Um, I I kind of teared up at the third one, which is the the scene where she comes to the 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 off the his store and does the eponymous line of "I'm just a girl looking at a boy, asking for him to love me." And when oh, yeah. he, and when he turned her down, I'm like, oh fuck. Like it, and it hit hard because you understand where he's coming from. He's been jerked around so much about this that he's like, I can't deal with this anymore. <laughs> it's like, no, uh, I'm not falling for it again. And I think no, there's another time where he. That's right. I for, I'm not. I I forgot about the part where he was at the um at at the set, and he kind of blew him off. She kind of blew him off as nobody in in the. Uh, in, when talking to the actor, so he left. I remember. I forgot about that scene. There, there's, the, there's the third part. Yep. So, so yeah, like, and it hurt because you want these characters to be together, but you definitely understand where William's coming from here. And I thought, fuck, that's the end. Oh, that hurts. Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and then um. And then he's at, and then and I think he's in a, a cafe with his her, her family, and they're like, "You fucking dolt! What are you doing?" <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think it's it's just when he uh, he comes to the realization, he's like, "Oh God, I I just uh, I made the wrong choice, didn't I?" Oh yep. God! <laughs> and, and this scene could have been a bad scene to end in because it's the standard Hollywood uh, oh they get together in the end kind of scene but it still works and that's the, and that's the thing that every time like uh, uh, god when people say they don't like this film they say oh it's formulaic and I kind of understand that it is formulaic but the it's so fucking charming and it and the actress plays so well in this movie and as as much as there is a formula, it's not as well worn as most formulaic romantic movies are. So yeah, there is a formula you can you can take out of there. It's the will they won't they push and pull kind of formula, but they play off of it so well that you still believe there is a chance that this won't work, even though you want it to work. And that is the highest compliment you give a movie like this. Is basically. Even though you know the formula's there, you're still so invested. Oh, I'll say, I'm still so invested that I want this to work, and that is the highest compliment you can give a film like this. Yeah, and I think it really shows uh, shows this at the end and everything because, of course, William and William and crew they rush to the the press conference that she's at before she leaves London forever, basically. Yeah, and of course. And they sneak into the to the conference and whatnot. And of course, um, as William's sneaking into the crowd to kind of get a spot to kind of sit and hang out and everything, uh, someone asks the question: Will you, uh, um, uh, or um, how long do you plan to stay in London and everything? And she's like, like uh, I'll be leaving immediately, probably after tonight. And then of course he he uh, he raises his hand to kind of ask a question, like he's a member of the press and everything. And of course. <laughs> Drops the line of, so, um, what if, uh, what if this guy was a daft prick and, you know, just kind of turned you down because he was being an idiot, so, would you change change your mind if he had a change of heart? And then, of course, she kind of plays it coy, like she doesn't know him, and she's just kind of referring to him in the third person. She's like, mm, you know, I, I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm... And you're just kind of in suspense about this, and then, of course... She kind of 
goes back to to the one guy who asked the question originally. She's just like, yeah, um, could you ask that question that you just asked a, a little while ago? So uh, yeah, um, uh, when do you uh, when do you plan to uh, to leave London and uh, or do you plan to stay? And she was like, oh, I'll be staying indefinitely. And you're just like, oh yes, relief. I know. <laughs> And in, in most movies, it would be the standard they kiss and embrace. But that was actually perfect for the film. Uh, especially with the joke of William being a journalist for Horse and Hound. <laughs> I forgot about that joke when I saw it. I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. Yep. The media scrum. I forgot about this part. <laughs> oh, God. As you could tell, I adore this movie so much. I. Oh. <laughs> Oh my god. Um what else is there to really talk about in spoilers in this? I mean, this is Richard Curtis's I think his best written film. He wrote Love Actually. He he did For Weddings and a Funeral, this movie, Love Actually, and wait, did he do For Weddings and a Funeral? Let me double check that. Uh he did an About Time. Uh, so, most will say probably About Time is his best film, which I can understand that. But I will go on record by saying that I think Notting Hill is his best written film. I'm just double checking to see if he wrote Four Weddings and a Funeral. Oh, he wrote some shit. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, he's wrote he wrote Mr. Bean. Okay. He did do Four Weddings and a Funeral. I thought so. Okay. So yeah, I mean I wish he would do more films. He he doesn't do a lot of films really. But his romance, even though I, I'm not a fan of Love Actually, uh, his films are better than most, I, I would say, to, in my opinion, at least. So, yeah, I I absolutely adore this film. I, I always have, and we can talk for hours on this if you want. But <laughs> unless, you got yeah. more, unless you want more to talk about, I mean... Um, I think uh, the scene where just... Just um, after uh, after she stays over um, from from the uh, porn tape and pictures being leaked and everything, yeah, um, that scene was uh, kind uh, kind of cute because of course she's just like, I just want to get away from everything, and and he's just like, that's okay, you know, we'll do whatever you want. I can I can get you get you a bath set up. I can do whatever hell we could just stay stay here stay here in my home and just do absolutely nothing and it's just kind of cute just um they're just kind of uh they're just kind of hanging out just just being ordinary it's not like a stereotypical romance movie we're just like like oh well we're very much in love let's let's go hit up the town and you know just kind of going parading parading around town just just kind of just showing off their love and everything just Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, it's just it's just kind of um, uh, low key and just very very normal, I guess you could say. <laughs> yes, it's a subversion of the standard tropes of romance films, where the person that is pursuing um, the love interest has to do these extraordinary things to get their attention or to show that they care. Uh, by doing, I, I would say, very outward expressionistic kind of things. Like, really outlandish things that in reality would be kind of creepy and kind of silly to do, in a way. But in this movie, because the, the woman has everything, <laughs> essentially, it, it, it was cute to just see it twisted around to where, oh, you just be normal people, and that will provide its own romance, which works really well and it works really well because of the actors and how charming they are in this movie so yeah i mean it it really it really is a subversion of standard uh tro- like standard romance tropes in a way while still being a f- sort of comfortable formulaic uh, romance movie so yeah i i i would agree with you that those are that, that, that those were some cute scenes um yeah and then of course um the turnaround of just just um the press just suddenly showing up and going oh my god she's at this guy's house oh my god and then of yeah. course just just um uh 
Anna gets gets pissed, uh, calls calls for her bodyguards to show up show up at the house to to take her away and everything. And then of course after she leaves, just William kind of asks Spike. He's just like, "Did you tell anyone?" And in kind of the comedic coy way, he's just like, "Well, I might have told a couple people at the pub." Yeah. And then of course just William with the with the dry response. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, I mean, God, there's so much. We, there's, is there a lot more to get into in this? I mean, we kind of covered the entire film. Um, one thing that people complain about about this movie, which I don't get, is the first kiss in the movie. Um, usually when a first kiss happens... It happens in the middle of the movie as sort of a attention builder to see if there is a romance going to happen. But right on Front Street, like in the first 10 minutes, the first kiss happens. And and because it's Anna who's the one that prompts it and is the aggressor in this, it's another one of those things that is a subversion of the standard romance trope. So... I thought that was always interesting. I think people at the time, I don't think people, maybe people don't feel this way now, but at the time, people thought that was kind of strange. All right, Zero, final thoughts? Uh, final thoughts, I feel that uh, Notting Hill, uh, even if it is a movie from the late 90s, I still think it's great. Um, I think really just uh, Julia Roberts really just puts the film together uh, just with uh, just how lovely the smile is when uh, when she smiles and everything and it kind of gives the a uh, whole movie uh, the movie star that's being constantly stalked by the press uh, sort of some credence to it mm -hmm. and then you have uh, Hugh Grant's uh, portrayal of William just sort of uh, playing the affable sort of counterweight to uh, to Anna's character and everything, yeah. and it, it just works out so nicely. And uh, overall, I just uh, I just felt it was just a lot of fun to watch, especially with the comedy pieces sort of breaking up things every once in a while, and uh, and all because the movie does get a, a a lot of tension from sort of the drama that happens and every once in a while, but. All in all, just it comes right back together when, uh, when they have a little bit of uh, comedy to sort of break things up. But yeah, just overall, just a fantastic movie. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, uh, Julia Roberts is the performance of the film. Uh, Reese Ephens, I think, is the second best. Uh, Hugh Grant's the third, but they're all great performances. Uh, again, uh, when it comes to romantic comedies, like Hollywood romantic comedies, is this has been my favorite for years now. Um, so I guess to have a balanced review, you're not going to have it here because I adore this film so much. Um, great performances, very charming. Uh, a, a film that subverts expectations that you expect it to be if you haven't seen it yet. Um, it's also very inside baseball with Hollywood, so if you're interested in that angle, it's there. Just a really well-written film that I think even to this day does not get the credit it deserves. To a certain extent, because there, there's still people who refuse to see it because, oh, it's a Julia Roberts romance movie. I've seen those before. And they're missing out on a great movie, I think. So, yeah. Uh, fantastic movie. One of my favorites of all time. So... Yeah, there's that. Okay, Zero, before we get to what we're watching next week, I have a question for you. All right. So this is going to be a bit of a downer. Um, today would have been the 71st birthday of Robin Williams, if he were still with us. Uh, Robin Williams had a very, uh, I would say, a very good career uh, in the film industry. Um uh, both as a comedic actor and a dramatic actor. So I'm just going to ask you, what is your favorite Robin Williams performance? If you'd rather just say Robin Williams film, that's fine. 
but I'm going to, I was going to ask for performance. So you can, you can also separate it. What's your favorite comedic performance? What's your favorite uh, dramatic performance? Go right ahead. What's your, Ooh, what's your um, this one for me is going to end up in a tie just in general. Okay. Uh, loved him in Mrs. Doubtfire because just, oh, yeah. that was just an absolutely silly movie and everything. But um, also loved him in Dead Poet Society. Oh, okay. Oh, Captain, my Captain. Okay. Yes. You know, I saw that movie five years ago, and I liked it, but I had one issue. <laughs> one issue <laughs> with the movie. And, um, do I, 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 you know what? I'm not going to spoil it. We'll talk about it all fair, but it's a good movie. Absolutely. But I, I just, yeah, like I said, I have one issue with it. And we'll get into it, I guess, after this. Um, so, oh, so you, you, Mrs. Doubtfire and Dead Poet Society. Okay. Um, God, it's hard not to say Mrs. Doubtfire in this. But you know what? I will go Aladdin. And it, some will be like, well, that's a, just a voice. So, like, it just says a voice acting. I don't think people these days understand how important Robin Williams' performance as Genie was in Aladdin. Because before that, no one cared who voiced cartoon characters. Ever. Ever. Like, and to an extent, that's a good thing, because you wouldn't have these movies with a bunch of stunt casting, where they would just get stars and not the best actors, the best voice actors to voice the characters. But... Robin Williams' performance in Aladdin is uh, was so important and and also so so great that and I, and I might be wrong on this, but uh, Robin Williams ad libbed most of the lines in Aladdin, but because the lines were so damn good, the animators decided to animate those sequences after the fact. <laughs> And if you don't know what it takes to do animation, to do that is a big hassle. But apparently they loved his performance so much that they spent the extra money and time to do those sequences. So Yeah, and for further perspective, this was back in the days when animation was still um, using using cell based animation. Yes. So we're we're not talking in the, the era of like Photoshop and Unreal Engine five where just Oh, an actor wants to completely go ad lib and off the script, whatever. We'll just blow away the scenes and just fucking redo it all over again with a pen tablet and whatever. Just no, no, no. This is back in the day when you still had old fashioned animation cells and these artists were doing the illustrations by hand. So yeah. very labor intensive. And to know that they basically were just like, we love this. We don't care that we got to redo this over again. It's totally worth it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really a performance that people just gloss over and say, oh, it's just his voice. Like, you don't understand how important, like, that movie was. Because it without it, I, I don't think, I, I think with that, uh, well, no, I was going to say without it, I don't think Disney would have continued doing animated films. But... Without Robin Williams' performance, you wouldn't have had James Earl Jones as Mufasa in The Lion King. You wouldn't have, uh, you know, these really good actors playing key roles in animated films. Without Robin Williams showing, oh, wow, I can actually do something with this. So it's, it's, an inc it's really an important film that he doesn't get enough credit for. So I, I would say Aladdin with his comedy. I think a lot of people also, because he's so, and he is so hilarious, they downplay his dramatic chops big time. And he's had some really good performances. Uh, Insomnia, One Hour Photo. Um, oh, if you haven't seen One Hour Photo, that's creepy as hell. It, 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 it doesn't stick the landing, but it's still a great performance. And of course, the movie he won his Oscar, Goodwill Hunting. 
uh, was a favorite of mine for a long time. My favorite dramatic role is The World According to Garp. Um, a very quirky film, but he had a lot of heart and a lot of, of feeling into the in the movie that... Uh, and this was before people knew he was a legitimately good actor. That he played a very restrained role. So, yeah, like this movie, uh, The World According to Garp, fantastic movie. And I think a lot of people don't give that, don't really remember that movie uh, from him to give him a shot. I, I think this was, it, wow, this was even before Good uh, Good Morning v- Vietnam and another movie I forgot about. Uh, this was before uh, the, the movie you mentioned. Uh, oh, God, you just said it. Goodwill Hunting. Good, not Goodwill Hunting, the one you just said. Uh, the Dead Poets Society is before Dead Poets oh, yeah. Society. I mean, he... This was, I think this was done in 81, if I'm not mistaken. I'm looking at his IMDb page. But, yeah, like, The World According to Garp, I, I think, is one of his one of his all-time best that he does not get enough credit for. And if you haven't seen it, and it's still, I think, you can easily, you can probably stream that. I'm not entirely sure. I'm having a hard time finding it on IMDb. Did I wait? Did I just dream that he was in the world according to Garp? Let me look it up real quick because now I'm getting scared. <laughs> yeah, the world according to Garp, 1982. Hey, the year I was born. How about that? Um, yeah, uh, this was a really good movie that I think a lot of people missed when it comes to him. So I, if you have the chance to check out the world according to Garp. I would recommend it. Watch. I, I think you should watch it. That's Glenn Close. And yeah, there, there you go. Great movie to watch. Okay, so we're at the time at which we end this episode. Before we do, we're talking about the next movie that we're watching. Zero, you chose the type of movie we're going to be watching the next two weeks, including the film we're going to be watching next week. So why don't you tell us what type of films we're watching and what's the film you chose? All right, so the movie that we're going to be watching is uh, Volcano High, or for anyone who um, know the Korean name, Hasango. Uh, it's a 2001 South Korean martial arts um, comedy film. And this one was huge because uh, it sort of brought Korean filmmaking and, or just to the international stage uh, because of the fight choreography, the special effect work, and just all in all, it, it just is a really fun movie. Um, some people kind of uh, riffed and said that it's like what you would get if you tried to turn the um, Capcom fighting game Rival Schools into a movie. So um, I wanted The Wiz to kind of uh, watch this one because just... Um, he's he's an avid video game fan, yep. and especially for fighting games. So and, I was and, just and like, Rival yeah. Schools is one of my favorite fighting games. So yeah, this is gonna be interesting. But um, so yeah, we're uh, kind of back on the martial arts movie track. So uh, and Volcano High will be the movie that we will be watching. Okay, so we're gonna watch two Asian action movies. Uh, you, and next week is gonna be Volcano High. Um. It's gonna be a weird one because there's a there's a, a history to this movie that I think we should discuss too. But yeah, uh, tune in next week for we discuss Volcano High, two thousand uh, the two thousand one South Korean movie. Well, it's North Korean would be really interesting. But uh, <laughs> yeah, that, I you know what? If there was a North Korean martial arts film, I'd watch it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, with that, we'll hear from you next week on the Wiz. And I'm Zero. And we'll talk next week. What? Oh, did, did I say something wrong? What, what happened? No, no. I tripped on myself. <laughs> okay. It happens. We'll talk to you all next week.